Hello and welcome to a brand new episode brought to you on the Four Eyed Radio Network. If you want to see more shows, eh, check out foureyedradio.com, eh? Sorry about that. Starfleet Escape Podcast. Prepare for launch in 3, 2, 1. Enjoy the ride. Welcome to the Starfleet Escape Podcast on the Four Eyed Radio Network, where we escape into the Star Trek universe. This is episode 59, and it's being recorded on Friday the 13th, November 2015. Today's topic, Star Trek 2017. I'm Aaron. And I'm Eric. This episode is brought to you by Revenge Lover, illustration and designs that fit your personality. For samples and inquiries, visit revengelover.com. Howdy, Eric. Hello, Aaron. (laughs) So, this topic is something that we've been speculating about and hoping for since uh, 2005. Yes. Uh, Every Trekkie's dream come true, the return of a Star Trek series. To television. Or maybe not. Mm. (laughs) But no, um, yeah, so we're dedicating our whole episode to this big news announcement because I think it's pretty significant for all of us. For everyone, yes. We'll, we'll have new stuff to talk about, Aaron. That's true. A continuation. This, this, will, <laughs> this will fuel the podcast for years to come. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. C- because you're, you're thinking that this might be the last uh, Star Trek movie for a while, Star Trek Beyond. Although I heard a rumor which, of yeah, 2019. Which we'll have, yeah, we'll have plenty to talk about that next year. Right. And I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about for future episodes because next year is the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. Right. So I'm pretty sure we're going to do a few special episodes next year. I'm um, sure. Yeah, 50 years. Goodness. That's crazy. Yeah. So I guess what we're talking about is that CBS has announced a new Star Trek series. Yep. On November 2nd of this month, year, star date. Do you know where you were when you heard the news? (laughs) I was at work and I was taking a break Mm -hmm. and I checked Facebook and I saw it. I was like, wait, what? What? <laughs> like I, I did a double take because I think I saw it on um, Doug Drexler's Facebook page, and okay. uh, Doug did many production design and visual effects for. Uh, well, he's been on the show since Next Generation, mm-hmm. all the way through Enterprise. Right. So I follow his Facebook just because he posts cool behind the scenes uh, stuff from time to time. Mm-hmm. And I saw it on his page, and I was like, what? And then, like, two seconds later, I saw it all over Twitter. Right. And, like, I mean, this took off on social media. Star Trek was trending that day on Twitter because of this announcement. Take that, Star Wars. Yeah, sc- screw you, Star Wars. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really excited for December. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's insane. Where where were you? I was at Dunkin' Donuts. My God. Did you celebrate with a, with a donut? Oh, my goodness. A little sidetrack. I, Dunkin' Donuts is not a sponsor of the podcast. But you... Although, <laughs> we wouldn't be opposed to that. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> they you, have... Basically, I want free donuts. <laughs> Well, base, what, listen to this, right? Okay. So they have this snickerdoodle croissant donut. Oh, I have I had that. Oh, my I God. I had that last Saturday. It was delicious. The best donut I've ever had in my life. I tweeted about it on Twitter. Okay. Dunkin' Donuts got back to me and said, here's a $5 gift certificate. What? Yeah. So I got a $5 gift certificate for that. Maybe I need to tweet that it's the best donut ever. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should. Uh, it was, it, I did have one last uh, Saturday, and it was super delicious. It, it, oh, my goodness. I was, 
I didn't know what to expect. I I <laughs> tore in half and then stuff started oozing out. I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> and then I just ate that up. Great tone. <laughs> check it out if if um if you get the chance. Oh, there's a Dunkin' oh, Donuts yeah. near you. Uh, but but all this happened at, at Dunkin' Donuts for you. That's incredible. Yeah, because yeah. uh, it was right before going into work. Uh, oh, I see. Me. Yeah. So, yeah, good times. So what 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 are the details of this announcement? What do we know? So the first episode on CBS. Uh, subsequent okay. episodes, however, will need to be accessed through CBS All Access, CBS's uh, streaming service. Now, I, I have to ask you, have you ever tried CBS All Access? I have not, but since the announcement, I've uh, looked into it a little bit more. I remember last year we reported on it right, uh, briefly, and we talked about it. Uh, just because they have the entire library of Star Trek uh, okay. TV shows. Here's my thing. So last Saturday, after I got my uh, croissant donut mm -hmm. from uh, Dunkin' Donuts, no, I actually went to uh, my my friend Doug's place, mm -hmm. and we we're just hanging out, whatever. And he is a huge Survivor fan. Okay. And the only way that he can watch it, uh, because apparently, like, I don't know, his cable sucks or whatever, um, is to have CBS All Access. Okay. So I was like, oh, cool. Can I see that? Because this this was just after that announcement. I was like, oh, yeah, CBS All Access. Maybe I should look at this mm -hmm. before I invest any money into it. Right. Um, and he did. He went to CBS All Access. He logged in um, from his computer onto his TV, and they had a, this big giant ad for Star Trek. Okay. Like all all seven hundred over seven hundred episodes. Blah blah blah. I was like, oh wow, cool. I wonder if they have the remastered. So we put on an episode of the original series, mm -hmm. and. It was not remastered at all. Oh, wow. It's the original, it's the original version. Wow. And I was like, that's kind of disappointing. Mm -hmm. Because it was all the old effects. Like, as soon as the episode started, you saw the Enterprise fly by. I was like, well, that's not the remastered. Mm -hmm. And then I was curious. I was like, okay, well, let's try a Next Generation episode. Right. We did Encounter at Farpoint. Instantly recognizable that it was not remastered. Interesting. So CBS All Access does not have the remastered versions of the original series in Next Generation. Hmm. But I will say, after trying out the service, he lent me his password and login and stuff. Mm -hmm. I have tried it out. It's not a bad streaming service. Mm -hmm. The player definitely needs improvement, okay. especially with advertisements and freezing and stuff. But if they make it a better player, um, I think this could be a really great service. And I really hope that they add the remastered Star Trek episodes to the service. Mm, I agree. One of the things about the service that seem interesting to me is the ability to watch your local CBS channel, a live stream of it. Yeah, that's really cool. And... I like that because I cut the cable entirely. Mm -hmm. I just have really good internet and I I stream everything. Okay. But to watch local shows, I did get a digital antenna for mm -hmm. my TV. The only problem is CBS in my area, I, I can't get any channels lower than five, which here is NBC. Okay. So CBS is two channel two for me locally so i can't get cbs at all even if i wanted to watch it live on tv through hmm. through cbs so i'm thinking okay maybe i do need to get cbs all access to at least supplement my viewing interesting interesting i wonder if they do that on purpose eric it's a damn conspiracy <laughs> <laughs> But not TNG's conspiracy, because that was a spooky episode. Uh, indeed. 
So what else do we know, Eric? Well, Alex Kurtzman, who was the co-writer of the films Star Trek and Star Trek Into Darkness, and Heather Caden will serve as executive producers. How do you feel about Alex? Well, I will say that he does co-produce a lot of television shows. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, more recently, um, Limitless for CBC. Um, He was the executive producer on that. Um, He's the co-creator, co-writer, executive producer of Sleepy Hollow, which is a fantastic show. Okay. He was, he worked on Fringe, which was a very popular show. Mm -hmm. He's also presently the co-developer and executive producer and writer for Hawaii Mm Five-0. Again, another uh, CBS show. Mm -hmm. Uh, He worked on Alias. God, he was on, worked on Jack of All Trades, Hercules and Xena early in his career. So he's done a ton of stuff. And he's not only done a lot of television work, but also a ton of films. Mission Impossible 3, two of the Transformers movies, Amazing Spider-Man 2, Watchmen, Eagle Eye. Of course, both Star Trek movies, like we mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, Ender's Game. So he has a lot of like co-writing and producing and executive producing experience. But when it comes to Star Trek, I'm worried Mm -hmm. because I'm worried that all we're going to get in this new television series is alternate universe junk. Like we're just going to get JJ's crap. Mm. And I want to put a little more faith in him Mm -hmm. because he does seem like a hardcore Trekkie because in all the interviews that I saw or read or listened to when he was, you know, talking about Star Trek and Into Darkness, he seems like a like he knows what he's talking about when it comes to Star Trek. Mm. At, at least when it comes to canon and all that stuff. And I know the movies obviously are presenting an alternate version of the events that we know in our time frame because they're happening earlier or things are changing. So... Like, I'm so on the fence with him being involved in this. Because on one hand, I know that he knows his stuff. But on the other hand, I don't want this to be like J.J. Abrams' bad robot Star Trek, the television series. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, is is bad robot producing this? I don't think no? so. Uh, that was actually one of my points uh, later down. But we'll, I can jump into it. So CBS and Paramount. So Paramount has the films. Uh, CBS has the television shows. Now, if they were going to have J- the JJ verse in the series, they would have to pay Bad Robot money to use it. Right, and in their announcement, they they did say that it was not. Uh, connected to the films. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me it's going to have to be Prime Universe. I would hope so, because that's what most fans associate Star Trek with. Right, because why pay Bad Robot for stuff when you already have 700 plus episodes of your own stuff, your own catalog that you can draw from? Right, which CBS obviously now owns all the rights to Mm -hmm. they've owned star trek for a number of years now right and if they're touting cbs all access and the fact that every single star trek episode is already on that service well that's all prime universe so why would you create a series on the same thing if it wasn't going to be set in the same universe right all right and then the last thing that we know, at least right now, about this series, like before we dive deep into this conversation, right. but as of this recording, there is no official series title or actors associated with the production, um, nor has the relationship of the new series to the existing Star Trek chronology have been announced. So we're still very much in dark 
of what's going to happen with this show. But we do know that this will be the first television series in history to launch on a broadcast network, but air primarily on a video on demand service. Mm -hmm. So again, as Star Trek pioneered science fiction television back in the sixties, it's writing history again by, you know, doing another trailblazing thing Mm -hmm. in this new generation. Just with, with that one point of this being, uh, Tra- you know, trailblazing. So, this streaming the series fulfills the prediction that Star Trek made that TV lost popularity in the 21st century. That's true. And, um, but we did see, like, Tom Paris, who was a big 20th century nut. Mm-hmm. Like, there's still, obviously, there's still some form of entertainment because. Oh, right. On Enterprise, there was always movie night, mm-hmm. and there were still new movies being made. Yeah. so Hollow I, novels, like all that stuff. I think traditional, the way we look at TV right now is obviously right. changing. So the comments that they made in Star Trek The Next Generation when Data says, oh, television loses popularity. It it's, could, it's true. Yeah, it could just be that we go from watching terrestrial TV to just on-demand streaming, whatever we want to watch, Digital, whenever we want it. Yeah, wherever, whenever. Yeah. On any device. Oh, yeah. It's already happening. Mm-hmm. And we've seen companies react to the changing face of what's going on in digital media because ratings don't matter as much anymore. Mm-hmm. Enterprise ended with, like, a 3 million viewer average in 2005, while shows like Arrow and Flash, which are critically acclaimed and popular and being renewed left and right, they're only averaging like 2 million an episode now. Mm. So Enterprise could have still survived in today's television market if it had kept going. Right. Because really, ratings don't matter anymore. And companies are even taking into account streaming service uh, numbers. But not only that, they're also sometimes including illegal downloads in their accounts. Mm, interesting. So just because like ratings don't matter anymore, I mean, it, there's other factors for shows getting canceled. Right, right. So what what do you want to see in this new series? All right. Um, I know we both have lists here, so... And a lot Um, of our our lists kind of overlap a little bit. Okay. So first, what I want to see is I want to see this television series set in the Prime Universe. There are a number of ways that they could do this. Uh, First, like we talked about, they could do a post-Nemesis timeline. So they could set it 15 to 20 years past the end of Voyager or Nemesis. And it would still fit in this time frame where we could have the actors that are still alive from those like next generation DC sign Voyager. Mm-hmm. We could have them potentially cameo on this new show. Right. Cause it's been 20 years. Yeah. So there's no need for old age makeup. There's none of that stuff mm-hmm. or, they could go even farther into the future and take the next leap into the 25th century. So do what next generation did for the original series Mm -hmm. and take that hundred year jump. We'll just do another hundred year jump. And then we've got things like, you know, we could do the temporal cold war again, although no one wants that, or, you know, the time ship relativity. Like we know that the Federation continues and explores greater mysteries in our universe. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one way they could do it post nemesis. Another thing that they could do is give us the Romulan war birth of the Federation series. Mm -hmm. It could still be set in the prime and alternate universe as a prequel because the split in the universe didn't happen until much later. Right. So it would serve as a prequel to both the Prime Universe timeline and it could still have the elements and the aesthetics 
of the JJ universe without being out of canon. One of the best things about that Mm -hmm. is that we could have the actors from Enterprise reprise their roles. That's true. Well, the one of the good things is, you know, you're gonna please both audiences with a exactly with this kind of prequel uh, because you can lead up and and I have uh, let me just bring up my notes here uh, for a, a series set in mm-hmm. in that timeline. Yeah, because like you mentioned, the universes don't diverge until twenty three. Uh, sorry, twenty two thirty three. Right. I mean, when when Kirk was born. Right, so you you could have you could show stuff like the Calvin, right, and uh, that which that kind of... which already fit for the most part. It still fit the aesthetic that has already been set forth in Enterprise, mm-hmm. right. which is fine. Mm-hmm. Like I have no problem with that. I mean, if you want a newer series that's still connected, and then you're like you said, we're we're pleasing both fans. Mm-hmm. We're pleasing the fans that have come into Star Trek through the new movies and we're also pleasing the longtime Trekkies. Right. And I know some might say, well, why do another prequel series if Enterprise got canceled or whatever? Well, my thing is we got denied the Romulan War that Enterprise was leading up to. We got denied that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that snubbed enterprise in the past i've seen this a lot online they're going back and giving enterprise a shot and going wow this wasn't as bad as people said it was i really like enterprise Mm -hmm. i'm seeing that a lot on social media and even on facebook I, i don't know about you but i feel like over the years people's attitudes towards enterprise have changed for the positive right no, I, so I I think another prequel series could work, and I, I like that because in Deep Space Nine we see how uh, stories set during war can still explore the right. various aspects of of uh, the human condition and moral issues. Uh, for example, Cisco in the Pale Moonlight, which was one of the most critically acclaimed episodes of all Star Trek, right. So, I mean, storytelling like that, I think, is, the, you know, the core of Star Trek. And getting into, like, kind of like that war aspect, Romulan War, just think about all that we're dealing now in the world. You mm-hmm. know, we're dealing with terrorism. We're dealing with bombings and, you know, refugees and all these different, like, horrible issues that are going on in the world that Star Trek can still address Mm-hmm. like they did with social issues in the 60s. Right. So I, I'll touch upon kind of what you said about the DS9 Dominion War in my second point. Okay. But I think the third thing that they could do for a type of series, and we've talked about this before on the show, was make an anthology series. Mm-hmm. That way you can explore every episode could be a different part of the Star Trek universe. Mm-hmm. And it would be a great way to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the franchise. Oh, yeah. You could do many arcs. You could do like, okay, we're looking at this uh, crew that's exploring the Delta Quadrant after Voyager came back Mm -hmm. in the 2400s. Or we're, you know, dealing with a battle that took place during the Romulan War. And we're focusing on like a small team of heroes. Mm-hmm. So there, there are a ton of things that they could do with an anthology series. And we talked about that a lot of times in the past. Like yeah. you could have like a Star Trek medical story, mm-hmm. you know, some, something that happens on another planet. And we have to see what happens with an outbreak and how, you know, the, the medicine of the future and how that's different, you know, something like, or maybe following Dr. Crusher, seeing where she is now, mm. you know, hire on Gates McFadden again for a couple episodes, boom. And mm. it's like, wow, you, it, it's great for long-term fans. And the beauty of an anthology series, kind of like a Twilight Zone for Star Trek, is you can explore so many different facets of the universe that we haven't seen before. Mm-hmm. And you can tell a really impactful hour long story that's more like a Star Trek short in a way. Like it's a short movie 
here's one topic with this particular character. And that way it's amazing because instead of having like a regular cast, so to speak, Mm -hmm. you could get some major actors to play iconic characters for an anthology series. Mm. I would love to see like Tom Hanks in a Star Trek uniform or, you know. Yeah. So anything like that. And Mm -hmm. there have been many actors that love Star Trek, but haven't been in it. And this might give them the opportunity to attract some big names and, you know, fulfill this actor's dream to be in Star Trek. But at the same time, think of the audience grab that would get. Right. That'd be huge. So the possibility, there are so many possibilities and routes that they could take with the series. My only thing is I want in the prime universe. Right. <laughs> Or what What if, the, you know, you had the anthology series and you had several episodes in the Prime Universe but also in the alternate universe or maybe even in an alt, another alternate universe? Right. We, we could even have uh, part of the anthology series go into the Mirror Universe. Mm-hmm. See what, what's going on there. The, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't have a problem if it mixed alternate and Prime timeline, mm-hmm. but it needs to be done well. Right. Uh, The second thing I want to see in this new series is a a serialized story because they have a shorter season and I think a shorter season has a potential to tell a really impactful story uh, that modern television audiences have become accustomed to. And things like the Dominion War in Deep Space Nine or Enterprise seasons three and four this isn't something that's new to Star Trek. I think a serialized story can really work with a new Star Trek series because there are so many new television shows out there today that follow a season long arc. Mm -hmm. You know, you think you've got things like Quantico, which is dealing with like a whole big conspiracy and it takes many episodes to unravel the mysteries Um, You know, Heroes uh, came back. It's Heroes Reborn. And not only are they picking up on things from the last series, but they're telling their own self-contained story within a short season. Hmm. So this is something that TV audiences grew to embrace in their television was, was these impactful stories that continue from week to week and less about the episode of the week. Right. Uh, My third point or third thing that I want to see, I definitely want to see television syndication. Okay. Um, I don't personally, I don't think that CBS all access is the right choice for Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Um, Considering that, you know, not everyone in America still has internet and, you know, there's an older generation of truckies that really don't deal with the whole streaming service thing. Mm -hmm. Either they don't get it or they don't want to deal with it. They just watch television. Um, And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think CBS has always catered toward an older audience. Well, it shows like um, NCIS and and JAG (laughs) uh, usually had an older audience. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So I I think it's, I think Star Trek is best when it reaches a multi-generational audience Mm -hmm. because the fandom is multi-generational at this point. It's 50 years. You know, you've got three generations of people that have grew up or watched Star Trek at this point. So my, my thing is I just don't want all access to be the only place to see this show. Mm -hmm. I know they're premiering their first episode on regular television, but I, I want it to keep showing on television. Mm-hmm. Like if they really want to promote all access, then give all access the first viewing or the first release date. Then a week later, release it actually on CBS television. Uh, okay. Why not do that? If they really want to drive people to CBS all access, then give it like a week long or even month long exclusivity. Mm-hmm. My fourth point is I want to see this show have a strong budget 
for visual effects and cast. Mm -hmm. Star Trek has always been really pioneering when it comes to graphics. So I want to see if, if they're putting their money where their mouth is and trusting this show strictly to one streaming service, then I really hope that they put forth their money and the money where their mouth is mm-hmm. and give this show a good budget. Right. The, the, no, no offense to any fan films or anything like that, but th- this isn't a fan film. Right. This is a legitimate television show for a major network. And so I think it should look like it. I, I totally agree with you on that, on that. My next point is I really want to see more focus on what Star Trek does best. Moral stories that reflect current problems in our society. I, what I'm afraid of is that this is going to be some action-packed, bang whiz eye candy that the movies, that the J.J. Abrams movies are. And I don't want that for a television series. Right. I mean, a thing about movies, if you want to make money, it has to kind of be that, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Right, right. But with television, especially a 10 episode or even 24 episode series, you have to have more substance than that, Mm -hmm. especially for a a show like Star Trek. Right. And who's to say if, if this is, if they're truly going all digital, who's to say that these episodes are even going to be 40 minutes long. It might be a full hour, like a Netflix Mm -hmm. show. Yeah. And that kind of harkens back to the original series when there was less commercial breaks on television. And those original series episodes are like 50, 55 minutes long. Yeah. So if they're, if they're going to have more time uh, for these episodes, then I don't want more pew pew shooting. Ah, We're fighting aliens. I want, I want to return to the original series, moral conflicts, Mm-hmm. And all of that. Um, and then my last point is to, I want to see, is to bring back old writers and production crew. I acknowledge that new blood is always a good thing for fresh ideas, especially with a new television show. But I really think that they should consult the great people that made Star Trek shine in the past. Mm-hmm. Like Mike and Denise Akuda. Um, you know, they did all the visual, like on screen, uh, like on the computer monitors, all that graphic design, Mm -hmm. like all the diagrams and stuff. Doug Drexler, like I mentioned in the past, uh, visual effects guy, Manny Cotto, who produced the last two seasons of enterprise and look how critically acclaimed those were from a fan's perspective. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, people like Jerry Taylor, who wrote for Voyager, Ron Moore, who wrote uh, for Deep Space Nine, and who gave us the Dominion War. And look at what he went on to do after Star Trek. He did Battlestar Galactica, which was huge. So there have been some amazing people that have worked on Star Trek in the past. I hope that CBS or Alex Kurtzman, I hope they at least consult that past talent Mm -hmm. or bring some of them on. I agree. And really that's, that's what I want to see in this new television show. Okay. I agree with most of your points. Um, Okay. A a lot of our points overlap. One of the bullets I've have here and we've talked about is the, you know, set the series after enterprise and during the Romulan war. Right, and like we said, allows both fans of the Prime and JJ verse to uh, mm-hmm. uh, to see events that lead up to. And one of the things I was thinking of was thinking about having the series set during the twenty two hundreds, so you could see potentially see the USS Calvin, or even see the early career of George Kirk. That'd be cool, yeah. And, and so, what I was, what I was going to say was, what would be very, very cool in the series is the last episode have the Calvin just approach the star system and then cut out before anything happens. 
And that leads directly into J.J. Star Trek. Either J.J. Star, uh, Star Trek or, you know, just the Prime Universe. Who knows what's going to happen? That would be amazing. I think that would be cool. Um, and if you, if you did, like, a Romulan War Birth of the Federation uh, series, you could do the same thing where the last episode is Archer making his famous speech that leads to the treaty being signed for the birth of the Federation. Mm, right. Yeah, because we don't actually hear the speech, right? It cuts off, like, they turn right. around and walk out Riker and Troy. Yeah, that'd be cool if we could get um, that guy, Bakula, to uh, do a cameo. Scott Bakula, <laughs> yeah, that would be great if we got him back. <laughs> yes, yeah, so... Let's see, we, we talk about that. And well, if we said during the time period of Enterprise, we get that payoff that we were robbed of. Right. Um, oh, yeah. Because uh, that, that just pissed me off so much when Enterprise got canceled. Because I'm like, we were so close to the right. Romulan War. We were so close. Yeah. And it's the one thing that you hear talked about all the time in the series, but we've never seen it. Mm -hmm. We've never seen it on screen. It's such an untapped thing that we want to see. And, and Enterprise was leading right up to it. it was just... <laughs> so close yet so far. It was. It was. <laughs> um, so another another bullet point I've I have here is set the series beyond Nemesis, like you mentioned. You know, keep moving forward. You can mention, you know, Prime Spock is gone. Right. Um, so that could be a, a plot point, you know, the destruction of Romulus. Another thing that they could do is borrow from or rework the plans from the animated Star Trek Final Frontier that they were thinking about doing in uh, the mid-2000s, yeah. uh, which was going to be a web series an animated right. web series for Star Trek dot com. I mean, some I of the, some of the yeah. ideas for that were were great. It, it sets it in a kind of a darker Star Trek uh, mm -hmm. world where it's, it's really the the frontier again. Yeah, you know, like the Federation was kind of falling, that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, and there were large spaces of or areas of space that were affected by anomalies that were created by excessive warp use um which was talked about in next generation yeah i think there might have been like someone made a like a bomb type of right. thing that like affected large areas of space so that would be interesting and i mm -hmm. think you could do a lot with that the next bullet point i have here is uh why we probably won't see a jj verse um you know why pay bad robot royalties when you can pull from your own material yeah, you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. And the next, uh, what makes sense to stream, and I kind of mentioned one of the things here, streaming the series of Phil Star Trek prediction of the loss of TV popularity. There was a strong push for fifth season of Enterprise to be released on Netflix. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's, which, there's still a huge uh, Facebook group for that. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that might have been the catalyst to make especially since yeah especially since they said that they were in talks with cbs at one point yeah that could be the catalyst that made cbs go oh you know what there's a lot yeah. of demand for an online star trek series mm -hmm. why don't we put it on our own on our own streaming service fan series do well streaming yeah support through fundraising and and let's compare uh, it's about five ninety nine a month for CBS All Access. Compared mm -hmm. that to the hundreds and sometimes thousands that fans have been donating to oh, see yeah. one episode of a oh, fan yeah. made production. I'm guilty of this. I've sunk about two hundred dollars into Axonar. Yeah. And right now all we have is the prelude. Right. So if if I can do that. I'm pretty sure I can, uh, you know, squirrel away six dollars a month, right, for a streaming service. That's like the cost of going to McDonald's for a meal. Yeah, it's like two coffees. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that Star Trek fans complaining about, you know, the price of this, whatever you mm -hmm. can afford it. 
if I, I seen some funny memes float around too, like there was a, a picture of someone's wall that was just covered in Star Trek action figures yeah. and merchandise. And it's like, we'll spend thousands of dollars on figures, but won't spend five ninety nine a month for CBS All Access. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there's some hypocrisy that's going on in the fandom. And right. my thought is we've waited 10 years for a new television series. Mm -hmm. It'll be 12 years since enterprise when this new series finally airs. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we waited this long. It's six bucks for a month. Just don't pirate it. Don't be a dick because then we'll, then they'll definitely kill star Trek's chances. Right. So don't pirate it. Just fork over six bucks. Like, really? It's six bucks. Yeah. And you're willing to spend all that money donating to unofficial... And unproven, in some cases. Unproven and yeah, non-canon Star Trek. Right. It makes sense to pay six bucks a month for canon Star Trek. Canon Star Trek that's going to look m- and acted miles above any fan film. Right. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I hope so. Now, I, I don't have any points uh, to this, but do you think they will release an episode once a week, or do you think they'll release the entire season at once? And which would I... you want? That's tricky. Um for Star Trek, and especially if their whole marketing effort is to really push people to use the CBS All Access service, mm. I would say, and I would think, that they would release one new episode per week. Okay. Uh, Netflix does two different models for new shows. They either release a new episode a week. I've seen some of their original series do that. Mm-hmm. But they've also popularly done where it's like, oh, it's all out there, all and of it, binge watch. in one day. And and you binge watch. Right. My problem with that is if you binge watch in one weekend, then you have a significantly longer wait for new episodes for like a new season to be produced. Right. And then you would cancel and wait for the next season and pay for that month. Right. It. Yeah. Right. And But I can see fans doing that. If, if they're really going to be cheap... I can see some fans waiting until all of this new series is out and then just paying for the one month and binge watch. Mm -hmm. I can see it both ways. To me, I would prefer a weekly Star Trek because then you're building up that excitement every week. It feels like a television show because it's like, if you end on a cliffhanger, it's like, whoa, what's going to happen? My thing with if they released it all at once is... The spoilers will instantly be uh, all true. out there, all over the place. Right. And I don't want to, like, ignore all of my social media mm-hmm. just because my favorite show came back in one day and I couldn't watch it that weekend because I have a life. Right. You know what I mean? No, like, I hear you. Yeah. So I would prefer if they released it weekly. Okay. What about you? Uh, after going through all that... I think I would prefer weekly as well. And you know what they might do if they want to keep people around for the year? Right. Release one episode a month. Well, kill me now, because that will take forever. <laughs> well, if it's going to be a shorter... like how many, I don't usually watch purely internet shows. So, I mean, how many episodes are there in, like, say, a season of House of Cards? I don't know, but I will tell you one example that's also a Netflix series, uh, Mm -hmm. Daredevil. Mm -hmm. They did, I think it was like 13, like 11 or 12 episodes. Okay. So let's say they do a 12-episode season. It would, or if even if they do 24, release two a month. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Okay, release two a month instead. And and that's the thing. They could, oh, that would be amazing because... They would film it, obviously, all at one time, Mm -hmm. spread the series out throughout the year, like you said, if they do. Because 
in old television and Star Trek, seasons were typically 23 or 24 episodes right. of Star Trek. So they could be halfway through a season airing wise and already be working on season two. Right. And then we get no hiatus. There's no summer break. Mm -hmm. There's no winter break. It's just like continual Star Trek. Right. If they did two a month and it was like continuous Star Trek, sign me up forever because <laughs> I will keep watching that. Right. Okay. You heard it here, folks. Oh, I will gladly pay them six bucks a month yeah. for Star Trek forever. Yeah. Star Trek forever. 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 Oh, perfect <laughs> name for the series. Star Trek forever. Star Trek forever, the anthology series. <laughs> Boom. We we just created it. Yeah. Alex Kurtzman, I'm available for hire <laughs> uh, to work on a new Star Trek series. So this, this next uh, point or discussion I want to have with you, the future of fan productions. Do you, okay. Do you think an official Star Trek production will hinder fan-produced web series no no okay. i think fan series are gonna keep going no matter what uh they got their own ideas their own agendas uh there was star trek web series when enterprise was still on the air like that was the infancy of it mm -hmm. so no i don't think that uh star trek production will hinder fan produced web series i think they're gonna still keep going okay what about you i think it might so i think fans want something to watch and i of think course. web productions are filling that void right now okay but i don't know if the demand for fan produced series will be there during a run of an official production especially one that will have consistent episodes because we have right. so many fan productions out there that are so inconsistent with mm -hmm. their uh, promised releases of episodes that have yet to be released. I, I, I do think that fan productions are going to be put through a trial of fire. And I think only the best ones are going to survive. So, in my opinion, Axonar, I still think that's going to get people's money, no mm -hmm. matter what. I'm going to support it, because it looks amazing. Right. Star Trek continues. I don't think that's going anywhere. Uh, Vic Magnania has proven himself and his team. Mm -hmm. And they are producing fantastic continuation of the original series. At a fairly consistent pace. At Exactly. At a consistent pace consistent quality, consistently good writing and effects. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going anywhere. I think they might have a little bit more trouble finding the funding that they need, mm -hmm. because I do think that once a, a television series is on the air officially, I do think there's going to be some drop off in support for fan productions. I don't think it's going to kill them entirely, but it's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. I agree. All right. So let's go on to our next section of the show, the subspace channels. Trailing frequencies open, Captain. <laughs> so the question that we put out there on our social media pages, do you think an official Star Trek production? Oh, wait, nope. Sorry. I'm reading the wrong line. <laughs> now we know <laughs> there will be a... <laughs> New Star Trek series in 2017. What would you like to see in this new series? From okay. Twitter, we have at Brown Pow, who says, I wouldn't mind at least one cameo by at Will W, that's Will Wheaton, as a sarcastic traveler. I would love to see that. That would be interesting to see. <laughs> Get him back. <laughs> I'm sure he would be willing to do it. He's done Big Bang Theory. Yeah, why not? Yeah. He's a cool dude. Yeah, definitely. And next on Twitter, we have at TrekRadio.com, who says, me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm sure we'd all love to be on an official Star Oh, I Trek. would love to have a cameo into, oh, yeah. in, in Star Trek. Um, moving on to Facebook, 
Matthew Justin said, the immediate firing of Alex Kurtzman. Sad face. So obviously he is not a fan of Mr. Kurtzman being attached to the series. It, it doesn't appear so. Uh, sorry. Uh, it's happening. Just be it's... happy that there's a series coming out. Amen. Uh, so next from Google Plus, we have James Bricknell, who says, I would love to see a next generation alternate timeline with almost no Vulcans and a more war- warlike footing. So I, I think a JJ first. A JJ next generation? Yeah. I'll pass on that. <laughs> I wouldn't mind seeing what a galaxy class starship would look in the JJ verse, because that thing would be massive. Yeah, I mean, and Into Darkness already gave us the freaking. I don't even remember the name of it anymore. Uh, what was that thing? Um, the Vengeance. The Vengeance. Yeah, we already got the freaking Vengeance, which was already effing huge. Mm-hmm. And there, even when the first movie came out, people were saying that the JJ Enterprise was almost as big as a Galaxy class anyway. Yeah, way too big. They, well, they scaled up the model and right. from the original model, so like windows were uh it's a mess. It was a mess. Anyway. Uh <laughs> yeah, uh moving on. Uh Frankie Hernandez on Google Plus said new uniforms and color coding going back to the OG which I guess he means the original series, the original gangster Star Trek series. Ah. Oh, and the ladies sporting today's mini skirt, LOL, doesn't hurt to ask. Uh, P.S., a brand spanking, awesome, state-of-the-art, design, immaculate, fantastic, gorgeous Starship Enterprise with a massive size never before seen, never seen before, yet quick and speedy, and transwarp drive pss also would love to see enhancements and improvements in overall technology that we're so familiar with like beaming replicators yada 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 all that to the next level being used in many different ways nanites you name it that's a lot frankie that's that is a lot (laughs) certainly a lot of ideas uh next we have helen rocket who says uh so She's mentioning someone in this. Uh, plus Dane Wallinga. Yeah, Wallinga. <laughs> yeah. Dave Wallinga. And I were just talking about this the other day. I know it may not be as popular as something more classic, but think it would be fascinating to get a look at the broader Federation and Starfleet. Something with admirals and higher, perhaps, instead of a single ship's crew perhaps how did the federation call it collies how, how did the federation coalesce oh like how did the federation come together right i can't read <laughs> what bumps do they have to work out what threats were there see i can't read i need a highlight uh <laughs> what threats were there from inside and out diplomatic and military how did our great utopia come to be what it is today and then Dane Wolinga uh, responded to Ellen Rocket and said, Thanks for the plus mention. One of the nice things about DS9 is that it made the universe feel more complete than the earlier series. In the original series in TNG, you had the bubble of the ship, and you knew that there was a big federation out there that would occasionally get mentioned, but it was never a well-thought-out setting. Of course, then DS9 was kind of odd because everything happening in the universe was for some reason centered (laughs) on this one space station. Sure, it was important to the war, but pretty much everything important that happened in the Quadrant was tied to DS9. Martok became Chancellor of the Klingon Empire because of something that happened on Deep Space Nine. The next Grand Nagus of the Ferengi Alliance worked on Deep Space Nine. The commander of DS9 unilaterally brought the Romulans into the war. Apparently, Starfleet Command just approved the idea. They n- never thought of it themselves. The head of the Cardis- Cardassian Union used to run DS9, etc. 
the universe was really small at the same time it was being larger than what it had become before. It would be cool to have something that jumped around a bit, have the ship off exploring, but then also have the folks at Starfleet Command and have the politicians and switch between them as appropriate. Make it feel like there really is a whole united federation of planets out there. That was a lot. Mm -hmm. And I agree with all of that. Yeah. Because it kind of ties into what we were thinking about in anthology series, but also look at a show like game of Thrones, Mm -hmm. which is taking place on this planet on a global scale with different following the stories of different political factions and different people traveling that sometimes cross paths and they're able to tell an amazing season of stories in 10 episodes with the episodes being an hour long each. Look how I would love to see that type of show happen on Star Trek where it's not just focusing on one crew. And what Dane Walinga said is amazing. Mm -hmm. You could, you could focus on the politicians at Starfleet command. You could focus on the crew of one ship. Um, How cool would it be to maybe start the series off with, you know, a particular ship crew getting into some mess on a planet. And then we have to see the after effects throughout the season Mm -hmm. from a political standpoint, from maybe a, um, you know, a JAG perspective right? from the, st- maybe someone on the crew does something wrong and then they have to be court-martialed for it. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll see that whole process. Then you can get like something like a, a political drama meets, you know, kind of like a law and order thing mm-hmm. within the realm of Star Trek. And you could do it all in one season. Um, I think that would be amazing. I completely agree with Dane. Yeah, I mean, one thing that, um, you know, just to have everything coalesce uh, nicely (laughs) (laughs) uh, would be to have a planet that is maybe a major Federation outpost with, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, political goings on, with a star base, with multiple ships that are based off that star base that go out and come back. Yeah. And that way we could focus on the crew of the star base. We can interact with the citizens of that planet. We could meet with ambassadors. We could see a ship going out. Um, How cool would it be to maybe follow um, a star Trek, you know, a Federation ambassador and all of his or her dealings in the Federation, which would be an excuse to go to many different worlds Mm-hmm. And ex- also explore the fl- federation from a political standpoint as well. Indeed. I, I think I think all these ideas are great, and it's nothing that that's outside of the realm that we've already seen in Star Trek, right? Because there have been a couple episodes here and there that deal with oh, here's the Federation ambassador that we're following around. Again, it could explore the potential of an anthology series. We can see different aspects of the Federation. Uh, Like I said, it's nothing within the realm of Star Trek that we haven't seen before. I mean, there's been episodes of Deep Space Nine where we've dealt with ambassadors. Mm -hmm. We've seen the other side of the political spectrum. You know, Measure of a Man was a fantastic example of seeing the judicial system in Star Trek, Mm -hmm. at least for Starfleet. So there are many aspects of the universe that have been touched upon Mm -hmm. that I would like a series like this new series to expand upon. Just thinking about trials, that episode with that Romulan that said he was a, his parents or grandparents was, were Vulcan, but it turns out they were Romulan. That whole episode was so good. And I could see that being drawn out and having, so much done in a series just based on that one episode absolutely yeah there's there's infinite ways that they could go about this yeah and that's why i'm really excited for it but at the same time i'm also kind of really nervous about it too Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and finally, from Google+, Plus, uh, Rachel mm -hmm. F., before we forget, says, Better animation, for one. Maybe some new species of aliens. Uh, better technology. Uh, Q's son. Yeah, I am... We could see what Q's son is up to. Like I said, if this was an anthology series, there's so much that we could explore mm -hmm. and come back to in the show. Right. So yeah, I think uh, so. It's very exciting. I think we've uh, we've come up with some good ideas, and our our social media followers out there have some great ideas as well. And uh, it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be a Star Trek fan right now. It really is. Uh, absolutely, it is. Interestingly enough, this new Star Trek series, which has been reported to premiere in January 2017, that's also the same month that the new Power Rangers movie will be coming out. Oh, snap. So it's going to be... It's a double fandom explosion for me. Oh, all over. Um... <laughs> Let me just say that January 2017 is going to be a very good month. Yeah, I mean, cause, I mean, next year is going to be so jam packed with Star Trek stuff. For just for the fiftieth, just for the fiftieth. I think this is definitely going to ride the wave of the fiftieth anniversary, big time. Oh yeah, and it's 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 perfect timing. You know, you have some space for because the movie is basically going to be the big. 50th uh oh yeah uh, and then <laughs> right after that you have the series mm -hmm. you know, short shortly after and i heard rumors that william shatner wanted some kind of a star trek uh, 50th variety show or uh musical uh but there hasn't been any any official word about that yet it's it's william shatner he wants to be involved in every chance that he can get now yeah yeah not not to say that that wouldn't be funny or cool, mm -hmm. but no, I want I want ships in space. I don't want <laughs> I don't want captains singing and dancing. Well, one thing for the was it the thirtieth anniversary? There was that huge was it the thirtieth? I want to say it was the thirtieth. That huge uh, show on UPN. UPN, yeah. That was like uh, you know. I, audience and like a mm -hmm. live thing and they had and there was that Frasier parody of yeah, Star Trek. Yeah, Frasier parody. Uh, something like that would be would be cool to see, although you don't have a network for it uh, to show it, although they could show it on CBS All Access. That would be kind of cool to, uh, you know, wet the Introduce appetite. Introduce people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just do a roast of William Shatner. Do they like a fan a, roast. Oh, they a fan roast. Them? A fan roast. Yeah, that'd be interesting, but they already did the, uh, on Comedy Central a few years back, they did a roast of William Shatner. I'm saying do a fan roast. Yeah, that, well, that could, that could be harsh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, pre-screen it, of course, but okay. I, I don't know. Yeah, don't yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, like we said, it's an exciting time to be around right now in the Star mm -hmm. Trek universe. Or to be a Star Trek fan. I'm excited to be alive. Yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, so uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Eric, if we were to find you on the interweb, where would we go to do that? Uh, you can pretty much find me anywhere um, as TrekkieB47. I'm on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you can also check out my podcast, uh, Ranger Command Power Hour, if you're into Power Rangers. And that's at Ranger Command PH on Twitter, RangerCommand.com. Check us out there. But yeah, pretty much I'm Trekkie B47 everywhere. All right. And if you were to find me, uh, just just Google at Nova Charter, and uh, that's pretty much all you need to do to find me. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Riza, and a bunch of other stuff as at Nova Charter. So check me out nice. over there. All right, and uh, thank you all for listening. We will uh, talk to you later. Track on. Keep on trucking. Live long and fun. This is the worst day You have been listening to the Starfleet Escape Podcast on the Four Eyed Radio Network, where you can catch a new episode every other Monday. You can find us on the web at sfescapepod.com. Follow us on Twitter 
at SF Escape Pod. Like us on Facebook.com slash SF Escape Pod. And add us to your circle on Google Plus by going to google.sfescapepod.com. This has been another great presentation of the Four Eyed Radio Network. You can catch more shows at foureyedradio.com.